Today, we're going to be talking about deconstructing the computer posture. Welcome to the Pilates Show, where we explore creative and innovative Pilates tips and techniques to help deepen the skill level of the movement educator while having fun. I'm your host, Casey Marie Hertz, and today we're going to be talking about deconstructing the computer posture. Modern life is very, very different nowadays, even from 20 years ago. The computer and the handheld device rules our lives these days. And believe it or not, I have definitely <laughs> spent lots and lots of time on the computer, as many of you know. Now, your clients that are coming in from work a lot of times need so many posture cues and education so that they can start to organize themselves through the day. Because as we all know as teachers, them coming in once or twice a week for an hour isn't going to offset the incredible amount of time that is spent at their desk at work. And let's be honest, people are on their computers, not only at work anymore, it's at home, it's at, you know, watching their kids at soccer practice. Everyone seems to be finding themselves doing this with little screens. Now again, it could be a laptop computer, a desktop, or even a phone. This is happening all the time. And it's very, very uh, detrimental, not only to the spine, but to the body as a whole. Our bodies don't know how to do this well yet. I'm sure many, many years from now, we might figure out how we can be more comfortable in this position, but it hasn't been that long that we've been tied to our electronic devices. Now, let's just look at some computer postures that are extremely common. More and more people have laptops. That means they can do all sorts of very funny things with their posture. Now, desktops are a little bit different, right? You have the keyboard and then you can place the screen somewhere else. That is optimal for the body. Uh, but laptops, although handy and you can take anywhere, can be really horrible for the posture because everything has to be brought down and low. So you're gonna see a lot of posterior pelvic tilting, a lot of squeezing in the back triangle of the pelvic floor, the hamstrings tight and weak, the shoulders rolled forward, this is a biggie, and what happens is, is the back part of the spine doesn't know how to organize anymore. Because of the compression at the front of the body into the eviscera, uh, this back body, a lot of times, doesn't have a prayer to bring it back up. And what happens is, is after time of being in this position, a lot of people will say, oh, my shoulders hurt. And you'll do all sorts of release work for this area, but it's trying to fight to bring this part up. But because the front body is so rigid and so tight and day after day, moment after moment, this gets reinforced, the back body doesn't have a prayer. So to really get the whole back body tissue to start to open up, it starts with the front of the body. Now, release work is key for helping your clients out of this positioning. But what's really nice is if you can set up a scenario for your clients to experience release work at a few different places in time. It's like killing two birds with one stone. Because when we do release work in one place, it's not that it's bad. But if I start to release my abdominal cavity to try to decompress and find space between my rib cage and my pubic bone, but do nothing for the upper body at that time, Sometimes you can borrow the tissue laxity or availability here, which might not be a lot, but a little bit, and bring it here. So it's like borrowing from Peter to pay Paul. 
What we're going to experiment with today is can we get the upper torso and the lower torso to find space and expansion at the same time. This is really going to start to skill build. Then from there we can start to move the arms to see if we can find a little bit more expansion in the front body, okay? So what I wanna talk a little bit about is the relationship of the psoas with the, the lats and the lower trapezius. So the psoas is the muscle that runs from the inside of the spine, right? and then branches out into the outside of the pelvis, blends with the iliacus, and then inserts into the lesser trochanter. It's one of our beautiful core muscles. It's core as it attaches to the spine and then becomes a deep hip flexor as it moves down and attaches into the leg. The psoas can become very short in this hunched, seated posture. The other way it can become very short too is if you're overextended trying to sit at your desk. So we wanna access and start to open up the psoas and open up actually the obliques, the abdominal obliques, because that locks in that pelvis to rib cage placement. Okay, so what we're gonna do with this overball is start to open up the abdominal wall, open up the obliques, play with the diaphragm descending into the viscera to help open up where the psoas attaches. Now, the psoas is pulling the spine from the front. What's pulling the spine from the back? Lower trapezius and lap. So what we're going to do is we're going to do some release work in the pecs so that we can get a correct arm swing so that the cape of the lat, which attaches into the arm here, can start to floss and get a little bit more freedom of movement. So off my stool I go. So I set up two sitting boxes here. You can do this on a Cadillac if your Cadillac isn't too wide, but this is a really nice place to work on this because you can bypass the tension at the front of the hip to really work on the torso a little bit. So first things first is I'm gonna get this overball. Eh, it's about half inflated and I'm gonna place it into my abdominal cavity. And notice that I'm allowing at the kind of seam, front hip seam, I'm allowing that to rest and my knees to bend here. Now, this can be a really intense feeling for most people, especially if they're not used to doing belly massage. You can absolutely do this on the floor, but this is optimal for people who are very tight in the hips. So from here, I'm gonna feel like I'm rolling out my belly from right to left. And when I find a tight area, I'm gonna drop down onto my forearms here, resting down, and then I'm gonna go into belly Buddha breath. So every inhale, I'm trying to push this ball through this nice sitting box to try to expand as much as I can, getting the diaphragm down into my abdominal cavity as much as I can, and then a sigh of relief exhale to relax on the ball. I'll show you that once. So it's a deep inhale. You can see it opening my back. And a sigh of relief exhale. <sighs> Collapsing around. You might have to do this five or six times to even get this tissue to open. Once you have that availability, notice this ball is directly opposite of where my psoas on the front attaches into the spine and my lower trapezius and lats on the back. From this point, I'm gonna take my Great Dane tennis balls and bring it into the ever tight pectoral muscles. From here, I place them right underneath the collarbone, almost to the outside of the arms. My forehead goes down, 
and I try to relax my body on here. From here, I cycle the breath into deep breathing, again, trying to get this area of the back to open. And once I start to, ooh, there we go. See, I just let go of all the tension in my pecs. Once you finally get the body to truly drop down onto the balls, you can start moving the arms ever so gently, seeing if you can maintain the openness and space, really creating a cape-like feeling like your body is acting like it's a, it's a suit that has just been thrown onto the floor. Once your clients get used to that, you can actually add some hand weights to do some pendulum arm work, some circles, and you can even go into some little flies here. This helps to re-educate the tissue, not only of the abdominals, not just of the pecs, but of the whole body. Once they stand upright, they can feel how wide their torso can truly be, which helps to educate the arms back into their placement. Here's a question from Margarita in Italy. Hi Jen, hi Casey. This week I'm working on lumbopelvic stability and limb strength. You suggest adding rotation of the pelvis in a bridge pose without moving the legs. Are you talking about finding three and nine o'clock while the pelvis is up? And in that case, the glute on the side of the pelvis that falls is released and the contralateral glute is supposed to work more? Margarita, this is a perfect question from the uh, Cadillac Refresher course. Uh, we're so pleased and so happy about how diligently that you're working on this and we love all the questions that, that you submit. So we are absolutely talking about, can we, via the strength of the legs, lift the pelvis up into a bridge pose and then find mobility in the pelvis. So just to review a little bit of clocking, we're gonna use the Mikasa ball as a fulcrum for movement. So first things first, laying down on the mat, you lift the pelvis up to place the Mikasa ball at the back of the sacrum, not at the low back. From here, you can help your clients find 12 and six o'clock without too much glutes, and then going into three and nine o'clock. Now here's the cue without the legs moving. A lot of times when people move into three or nine, what'll happen is they'll want the legs to go with, right? We wanna try to find, can we mobilize the pelvis here without the legs doing too much of the work. And of course, this is the precursor skill building movement of doing this in bridge without support of the ball underneath. So if you think about having the pelvis on an over ball or Mikasa ball here, it is a supported bridge position where you can have your clients really fine tune and work this moment. Now notice, it's not that my legs don't move at all because obviously they are gonna move a little bit because the pelvic bone's connected to the leg bone, right? And so what we really wanna find is that it's almost a little pistoning action. So as for me, as I go into, this is my nine o'clock here, that my leg is really deepening into the socket. This femur is drawing in as this femur is reaching out just a little bit. And then when I go to the other side, it's a pistoning of the opposite direction. So this starts this beautiful weaving motion of the femurs in the pelvis. This is so, so vital and so important to gait. We really want to have there be a really beautiful articulation of the femur and the pelvis un unobstructed. Now, little pitfalls that you're gonna see are when someone goes into three or nine, a lot of times you're gonna see a hiking of a hip or again, a shifting of a leg. We wanna try to stay away from that. So once your clients have mastered 
doing this with the support and the information of a ball underneath the pelvis, then you can bring them into a bridge, right? Now they have to figure out how to organize in space without the information of a ball behind them. So can they start and do that little three and nine o'clock clocking without hiking a hip here? And Margarita, you're absolutely right. The side of the pelvis that falls are drops to the floor. It's not going down, it's just a rotation of the pelvis on the spine. This side releases the work a little bit, while the opposite side has to pick up the work on the hamstring lateral hip. And then when you go to the other side, it takes its turn. A lot of people will have different strength and articulation from right to left here. But again, this is a small rotation of the pelvis on the spine. Keep it small first, then you can experiment with larger ranges of motion that would create more of a challenge for the back line of the body and for your client's awareness of where their pelvis is in space while it's floating up and off of the mat. That's all for today. And if you have an idea or a question that you'd like to see answered in an upcoming episode, you can comment below on Facebook, Twitter, or our forum. See you next time and never stop learning. This one's my camera, right? <clears throat> okay.